Hey there, this is Dan. You're watching this all DC, and this is my quarterly meta video. We are going to look at everything that is happening with Competitive Warcry in the winter of 2024. Very exciting. There's a lot to get to, so let's just jump right into it. I want to start with the win rates of various factions. Now, this list is starting to get long. Um, the list of Factions with reliable data has grown quite a bit because there has been a lot of tournament attendance recently. This is going back to the January FAQ of last year, so this is a whole year, but you'll notice that there's a very different amount of games played on a lot of these factions than there was just in the autumn meta video, and that's because tournament participation has just been really high lately. Uh, in November, there were quite a few tournaments, lots of people going. And then in January, there's been a whole bunch. Uh, December, of course, there's always a bit of a lull. Uh, that's just how December is. But looking at this, we've seen a pretty definitive top coalescing in terms of factions. Now, we'll get to more about that when we get into like archetypes, things like that. But when it comes to factions, uh, Nurgle, Horns of Hashut, and Karadran Overlords define the meta. Now, we are talking about Nurgle Demons. Uh, Nurgle Rotbringers are all the way back down. <laughs> they are the mirror image of their demon counterparts in terms of win rate. But the interesting thing about this is that Soulblight Gravelords has been in a bit of freefall lately. I think after the nerf to them that came a year ago, we saw... A huge proliferation of missions that favor them quite a bit. It really hid, I think, how much the nerfs to Soulblight Resurrection really damaged them. And so that's why now that people are playing a lot more balanced packs, uh, a lot of games and missions where you need to be kind of covering a lot of different bases to succeed, uh, I think we're seeing Soulblight kind of have issues there. I've seen uh, a friend of mine who plays Soul Blight, and honestly, he just thinks that his Beasts of Chaos are better. Um, he just straight up believes that. And uh, I, I find that really interesting given kind of the historic success of Soul Blight, but uh, we are seeing kind of their win rate go down a little bit now. So the fourth faction, now there's quite a few in between the top three and Ogre Maw tribes here, but when you look at the incredible uh, sample size of Ogre Maw tribes, 130 games played, the fact that they have just consistently stuck with that high 50s win rate, uh, I would say really puts them um, on their own as the number four in the game. Even though there are higher win rates, just the, the Ogre Maw Tribe's results are just so robust and so consistent that that's just a very, very impressive performance by them. Same with Cruel Boys, kind of right below them, uh, just cruising along at 55 percent win rate despite having just a massive sample size being you know one of the most popular factions in the entire game um if not the second most i believe yeah i think cruel boys is the second most popular faction so that is very impressive and very cool and i think it talks a little bit to the limits of tier lists and just these win rate tables on their own i think you kind of have to uh, combine them a little bit that's why i don't go straight to a tier list although i will include one in this video and we're just going to have to talk about like what that means, what kind of is going on behind that. There's also a pretty definitive bottom to this metagame here where Corn, uh, Bloodbound, Zinch, Arcanites, Night Haunt, the Unmade, Daughters of Cain. I actually don't think that this is where the bottom of Warcry is. The worst factions in the game aren't even being played enough to get onto this. We're not even getting enough games in uh, for, for me to really show their results. But one thing that kind of ties all these factions together is that they kind of all rely on speed. Uh, the only slow faction of the you know really, really awful win rate ones is uh, Nurgle Rotbringers here. Everyone else is trying to kind of run around quickly. Um, Corn Bloodbound actually is a lot more speed reliant than you would normally think because they have all those blood reavers and those are move five so it's uh it's really interesting just to see all that kind of tied together then in the middle here there's quite a lot to think about the green section one thing i mentioned in my autumn video is that the green section is uh, decreasing a little bit that has somewhat continued a little bit and that's partly just because Players are just getting really good. It's been a full year since we've had a really major update to the game. And so 
uh, players are just kind of learning what's solid and and some factions can handle that and some cannot. And so that's just kind of the reality of how it's shaking out. And that's a fairly natural place to be when uh, the same points algorithm has been in place for a whole year. Let's talk about what makes the best the best right now in the game. There's two ingredients right now in the top three factions. The first is they all have hyper-efficient defensive chaff. Lumineth, Flesh Eater Quartz, lots of other factions have really good cheap chaff, and they can sort of play that to some success, and it can work really well sometimes. Um, but it's just not the same as having chaff that you feel fairly confident is going to stick around a few rounds. You'll still have a few of them left all the way at the end of round four, things like that, so that you can really get a lot of um, sort of bang for your buck on them. You can just keep getting value from them over the course of the game, keep scoring points over the course of the game. Uh, those are all really powerful things. And then the other thing, because there are a few other factions with defensive chaff, uh, the other thing that they all have is just spice is all I call it. Just one other big league tool where even if they didn't have really defensive chaff, uh, they'd still have something interesting in there. So the first is KO, have their Aether Cannons that do so much damage along with Fight for Profit. Horns of Hushut have their Flamethrowers where for a triple they can just napalm an entire area. And then Nurgle, actually, the special thing about them, weirdly, is that they don't really require any dice whatsoever, which means they have incredible synergy with all kinds of dice-hungry dragons and things like that. And their leaders are pretty cheap, too. So you can get any kind of big, stompy ally in there, and you can just plan to give all the dice to your big, stompy ally. And so Nurgle just... They bring allies in better than any other faction in the game, which is kind of a funny, you know, thing to hang your hat on. But that is what they're good at. They are the best allying faction in the game. The three factions each have these two things of uh, the super defensive chaff and then one other twist to them uh, that makes them really powerful. But there is a little bit more going on uh, just below that tier. And... I'm really excited about kind of a new sub-meta uh, because there have been nine new factions appearing in the last two months. Now, some of these win rates are low, but it's really worth looking at because I do think they've legitimately changed what you can expect, whether you're just going to your local game store or whether you are going to a real event, whether you're going to Adepticon in two months. These change kind of what the game is. So we're seeing... A lot of monster killers and wilder corpse hunters doing extremely well. That's something that if you look at the kind of high win rate factions, monster killers are doing incredibly well. Still kind of early returns here, and wilder corpse hunters are doing very well too. Uh, hunters of Huanchi, we'll talk about that a little bit later. That's also a very exciting uh, kind of development to talk about. But let's get into these new factions because I think it's really interesting. The fact that some of the win rates are low, I think, is due to people still experimenting. Um, the painting meta is keeping some of these in somewhat low numbers. For example, the Cities of Sigmar stuff, Castellites are impossible to paint. I don't think we'll ever see very many of them at tournaments, despite how incredibly popular they are, how much they've sold. I know so many people with gray Castellites in their collection right now where they bought a ton of them and painted a couple, you know, maybe a hero or like maybe a, like one unit and then they couldn't bring themselves to paint another one right away. Um, it's going to be a long time before people get those Castellites Warbands ready because they are just not fun to paint. So that is, I think, keeping them off the table, but they sold really, really well. A ton of people have them. They will get played eventually. It's just going to be a while. Even maybe by my next meta video, they still might not be a very popular faction. But eventually, Castellites will be all over the place because I do think they're pretty solid. Even though, you know, here, obviously, <laughs> very, very average returns. But this is only after 10 games, right? So we have no idea, really. But the fact that two of these are kind of concerning already from a win rate standpoint is pretty interesting. And... It's really cool to kind of look at the brand new factions that were really meant for Warcry, and these are uh, Gorger Maw Pack, Monster Killers, Wilder Corpse, and Flame Seekers. And take a look at the fact that they're all popular and 
good. Um, people are playing Flame Seekers and Maw Pack and Wilder Corpse and Monster Killers. All of them are getting pretty solid participation in tournaments right now, especially for how little they've been out, how people have had to, you know, very little time to paint them, really. So I think it's worth kind of going through a quick rundown of what's going on with each of the four of them and, and how people are doing with them. Gorger Maw Pack are shockingly strong to play against and um, to watch them on the table. They will just get in your face so fast, do so much damage, be so hard to kill. Um, they have a very low toughness, but they have a ton of wounds. So anything can fight them, and that's great. But no matter what is fighting them, it's going to take them forever. And so uh, that's a really powerful thing to have. The issue with Gorger Maw Pack is they don't score a lot of points. Um, you will often, like, table your opponent and still lose. And that's just a tough place to be. So if you can figure out how to kind of take that and score points with them, there's a lot of options. You can use Underworlds to get some chaff in there. You can use the Gobblepalooza to get some chaff in there. You can use, say, um, a Brute Boss ally to sort of point and click at objectives, things like that. There's a lot of different things you can try. But there's a lot to like here in Gorger Maw Pack for an enterprising player because uh, the tools at your disposal are incredibly powerful but the weaknesses are just as powerful. And so figuring out a way to overcome that is just a really cool puzzle for an enterprising player. And I, uh, I encourage people to give them a try because I think there's a lot to play with there. Monster Killers are the Cruel Boys. They are an assortment of incredibly nasty abilities with pretty respectable profiles, which is kind of cool. Uh, they've got, you know, neck slicers of various kinds have really powerful abilities. The leader is very good at dealing damage, has good net insurance, has a really good ability, just a lot to like there. He's a little fragile, but not completely fragile. He's usually going to get a couple attacks in. Um, very interesting. There's a lot that they can work with, and it's kind of a new play style for Destruction. Destruction doesn't really have anything that does that. So that's really, really powerful and really good. And they are crushing it right now. And in the hands of multiple players, too, they are doing very, very well, humming around a 64% win rate, which is very scary. Wilder Corpse Hunters are the Cities of Sigmar Bespoke Warcry Warband, and they are very, very powerful as well. Um, just as many games, I think more games than Monster Killers, and running around a 59% win rate, which is very powerful. Uh, still not a ton of sample size on either of these, but enough, you know, more than 30, to at least start wondering, start really thinking about how much is there and how much of this is maybe just really competitive players getting their hands on them first versus actually there's just a lot here. Um, Wilder Corpse are in an interesting spot where one box is not very good. One box of Wilder Corpse puts you halfway between these two play styles, where one is incredibly shooty, um, this like incredible gun line artillery play style, and the other being this kind of dogs run up and then you use the ability kill kill to just do automatic damage with the dogs being in range. Um, and of course, the dogs have a really interesting disruption ability as well. So you have these two play styles that are actually kind of similar in terms of um, you just kind of point and click and then ruin the thing that you point and clicked on, <laughs> whether it's dogs, run over, disrupt it, and then use your ability, blow it up, or it's just gun line shoot. Both of those play styles are really powerful but you kind of need to get two boxes to be able to then shift from one to the other because one box will put you halfway in each and not really be able to play either at a really high level. But I think people figure that out pretty quickly. I think a lot of folks running them have been skewing them one way or the other, and it's been working really, really well for them. Both styles are really powerful, and I really suggest if you like them, just maybe just wait until they are on sale separately and then grab them uh, to get the second one, and then you know you'll be able to play either play style, and it'll be really powerful. Flame Seekers are not doing that well from a win rate standpoint, but I do think they're pretty good. Uh, they have melee damage and move actions, 
And that's kind of just a simple but effective combination. Uh, their abilities can really blow up damage, but only onto things that they are currently fighting and as an individual. And then uh, they just have the bonus move actions from the Droth Master. Their limitations can be kind of tough. You have to avoid getting one shot taken down. So a lot of the really big, scary titans in the game, things like Varengards, things like Ogre Maw Tribes leaders, things like Fomeroid Crushers, those things can really be nightmares for Flame Seekers. And then the other issue is trying to cover the board. You don't have any true chaff in the faction. Your cheapest fighter is 95 points, which is a really tough place to be when it comes to scoring points. And so you really need to try to figure these things out. I have a few ideas that I'm kind of excited to test. I'm going to try to bring them to an event at some point in the near future. Um, so they're not doing very well from a win rate standpoint, but I think there's a lot of tools there. Uh, to kind of give a reference, Jade Obelisk, who are running around a 53% win rate right now. Again, not very high sample on Jade Obelisk, but uh, certainly pretty promising. Um, you know, only two games above 500 in terms of 19 and 17, but uh, people are doing okay with them. I ran them to a tournament and uh, managed to actually 4-0 that tournament. I do think that Flame Seekers are very comparable to Jade Obelisk. Their scale breakers are very similar to Desecrators. They have some differences. I think Flame Seekers have better abilities, but Jade Obelisk have better ally choices, things like that. But I do think if Jade Obelisk can do well for some people, I think Flame Seekers should be able to do well for some people too. And I think that we'll see that eventually. I think right now there's a lot of traps in Flame Seekers which is something that's different than Jade Obelisk, where a lot of the things that are really bad in Jade Obelisk are obviously bad, and so people try to minimize them or minimize how much they rely on them. Whereas a lot of the things that aren't very good in Flame Seekers aren't terrible, and so you want to try them out, and I think people are trying them out, and maybe it's not working that well, but that's okay. Overall, I think all four of these are very powerful and very interesting new releases to the game. They kind of raise a question of power creep, especially Monster Killers right now and Wilder Corps. But I really think we need to see how the Lumineth Riverblades and the Nighthawk Pyregeists come out to see really exactly how much power creep is actually happening with the new Bespoke Warbands. If those two come out and they're really powerful, I think we can really start to say something about how GW is kind of approaching how they do bespoke warbands now. If they come in much less powerful, then I think we can kind of put the power creep issue to bed. Uh, that'll be a really interesting video that I'll be able to make in about a month or so that I'm really looking forward to. Let's take a look at the Grand Alliances. And uh, sort of the biggest thing that jumps out here is how concerning chaos is in general, especially that they are this low when Nurgle and Horns of Hashut are both fairly popular and so high in win rate. That's really crazy. A lot of chaos is based on, yes, some of the old bespokes, but the old bespokes don't really get played much. Very few of these games are on the first edition bespokes. A lot of it is on, you know, various popular factions like Corn or Zinch Mortals or uh, even Slanesh Mortals is getting a lot of play. And those factions really rely on what I call chaos warrior equivalents. Um, Slaves to Darkness is a very powerful faction when run aggressively, but has a very negative win rate because people love to run Chaos Warriors because they're so cool and the new, new sculpts are so good. And Chaos Warriors and all their equivalents like Bestigors and the Big Zangors and Blood Warriors and Painbringers and Twin Souls, the, the Nurgle version, uh, Blight Kings, things like that, all of those Chaos Warrior equivalents are really struggling in the game right now, are really, really bad, and um, can even be tough to use in casual play, can even be kind of tough to use in kind of kitchen table play. I would say um, the Slanesh ones are probably the best in casual play. Those are pretty usable, but still not kind of breaking down the doors of competitive anytime soon. So the fact that Chaos sort of runs on these fighters is a really tough look for them, especially when, you know, some of the things that aren't those fighters are like 
these move five demons, like what Slanesh is doing or what Zinch is doing. And, and those can be really hard to use too. So chaos is in a really tough spot, I think, um, both in terms of the bespokes and in terms of the chaos warrior relying factions. And it's interesting because I think they do have some of the best allies in the game, but even a really good ally sometimes can't save some of the weakest factions. And so that's why you see, I think, their win rate just be so low compared to every other Grand Alliance. Um, Death also is technically below 500 here, although only by one game. Uh, they kind of have this elite issue where lots of Death factions have really efficient chaff, but the elite options are a little bit lacking. There's some okay ones, like there's the Vargos Courtier, there's the Astrogan Exemplar, there's the um, Abhorrent Arch Regent, but that's just a much less, you know, way fewer options as far as choice is concerned than what the other Grand Alliances have, which can be a little bit tough. Order is interesting because 50% of these results are KO and Stormcast, and KO and Stormcast are both very good, but the rest of order is a lot less scary, and so kind of those things prop up order. Otherwise, order really does suffer from just having so many like trap support heroes and things like that that are not very good. Um, but there are really solid things going on there. The reason I wanted to bring this up, though, is to really show how powerful destruction is right now, because you don't see it with any one faction because none of their factions are in that top three. But every faction has access to really powerful tools. And Gloomspite Gits is one of the more powerful or more popular factions in the game. And they have a really low win rate. Can't talk today. But um, the rest of Destruction is doing really, really well. And part of that is because there is a sort of secret destruction um, sort of dominant competitive archetype that doesn't show up in faction win rates, but that is one of the main pillars of the competitive format nonetheless. It's definitely the biggest pillar of the U.S. competitive meta, but it is popular enough in Europe that you need to kind of know about it too. Uh, you'll usually see one at a tournament. And this is sort of destruction soup. And if you just took soup destruction it would be doing just as well as kind of the very top factions in the game. You just don't see it because in every archetype that it gets played in, it's mixed in with people just running their faction pure, uh, doing things like that, kind of doing kind of wild and crazy things with their faction. And so its win rate is kind of spread among all the factions that, that run it because it is soup. And so whatever sort of your faction is, isn't really necessarily uh, telling you what's going on. I think the reason that Ogre Maw Tribes has the highest win rate is because the most important ingredient to Destruction Soup is just natively in their faction. You have to take it because it's an ogre leader. Um, otherwise, I actually think Iron Jaws is the best soup. Uh, a lot of people that I respect think that Cruel Boys is the best soup. Uh, I think Monster Killers is kind of making an interesting play for that. Uh, but Ogres is probably the best pure-ish one just because um, they have those Ogre leaders. So how does Destruction Soup work? Every sort of version of it is very different, but the ingredients start with an Ogre Titan. Um, a Mega Boss is an okay substitute, but it's not quite as good. It's not on the level of, say, a Crusher or a Gutlord or a Tyrant or even Hrothgorn, who gets to be a Titan by just being huge and then being on the old shooting algorithm. So he gives you the kind of artillery output that the, uh, the other Ogre leaders give you in melee. And so you want one of these big things, and then you want an attack buff. Uh, you're going to use either a Brugit here, or you're going to use a Divine Blessing, specifically the Ferocious Divine, Divine Blessing. Uh, that's the one that gives plus one attack uh, for 30 points. And so you can really justify either one. A Brugit costing 70 points is a little bit more. It also slows you down a little because you have to use the Brugit ability, and then you get to use your big destruction titan. And so, you know, your opponent gets to kind of react a little bit, move around, they're going to get to, um, you know, try to do something about the situation you've just put them in. But 
the reason that it's kind of nice over a divine blessing is because that brugit is a pretty solid body for 70 points and the amount of damage you get out of the brugit is just silly i mean it's it's stupid honestly um it's it's one of my least fun things to uh play against um the divine blessing is a little bit less damage output but uh, for 30 points, you could shave a little bit. You don't get the extra body from the Brugit, but you get 40 points to spend on something else. And you also get a much quicker damage load that can uh, that can come out for you. Um, you can just kind of run over and you're already getting the boost right away. And so that can be really powerful and a much quicker tempo swing. And so you can really justify either one. Then after that, you're going to want chaff with utility. And this can mean a few different things. It can mean orcs where their utility is having 15 wounds and being very very cost effective um, specifically you're going to want either gut rippas or ard boys there uh, then you get netters as another option so the utility there is that they can just take an opponent's best fighter and just turn it off so anything that you can't insta kill from your ogre titan uh, you get to just say no to um, or you get underworld's noblars and the amazing thing about Underworld's Noblars is they all have extra wounds, so they're on a uh, much more powerful points algorithm for move for chaff. And then they all have like weird little abilities, which are just very useful to be able to keep in mind and to keep the ability to kind of threaten in multiple places on the board. They give you this very kind of 3D chess feel when you play them. Um, because every single one has a different ability. They're also very, very difficult for the opponent to track, which is not a reason to play them. It's actually, like, it's not a good thing that it's impossible to tell the different Underworld's Noblars apart, but it is impossible to tell the different Underworld's Noblars apart, depending on kind of the, the painting that's uh, taking place there. And so, that can kind of put an additional mental strain on your opponent, which uh, can give you a little advantage. It's not something that is good, you know, but it is something that is there. Having played against ogres a lot, it's much more tiring to play against them and you have to constantly be asking, which one's that? What does it do? And it kind of takes you out of your plans. It makes you take a little bit of extra time. Uh, after that, you're going to want a secondary and tertiary threat uh, this can take a few different forms. I think that having either a brute or a brute boss is a really uh, needed piece here. Um, then you can have Trogoths, you can have Ardboy bosses, you really have a lot of different options. Um, I think the Trogoths and the Gobblepalooza are really what lets Destruction kind of use the ally rules in kind of a wild and more effective way than every other Grand Alliance. No other Grand Alliance can ally in good chaff None of them can, except for destruction. Trogoths count as a thrall, not as an ally. So you can have two allies and still bring in a Trogoth to get that third ally. And it's still a threat. And so the fact that no other faction can do either of the two really powerful soup things that destruction does is really incredible and part of why they're so good. The kind of things to look out for here is basically when you play against them, they will put a just stupid amount of damage onto you. It's incredibly unfun to play against uh, any time you are trying to play something that isn't specifically planning for Destruction Soup. And the reason is because it completely negates your ability to play anything under 200 points um, because they will just... Sorry, anything between 80 and 200 points because an Ogre Titan being buffed up can delete it in one hit, and deleting a 200-point fighter, deleting a 175-point fighter when you only cost 300 points, doing it in one shot is just stupid, and it's <laughs> it's very silly. Um, so, you know, I think it's very popular, especially in the U.S., because it's the competitive faction that your version is going to look really different than any other person's version. So you feel like you've put a personal stamp on the archetype. Um, and I think that's why it's so popular in the U.S. But as a kind of overarching archetype, this is one of the main pillars. And I do think it's time to stop pretending it's cute because 
at least personally, I think it's really unfun to play against. I think it's really fun to play as. Um, but I think it's a, a pretty crazy thing to have in the meta is something that can just put this much damage out there while still um, having so many capabilities outside of the thing doing that much damage. Let's get to a tier list now, having said all that. And it's kind of difficult uh, with all of the ally rules to kind of decide on some of these where uh, you kind of have to balance potential versus actual achievement out there. And so it's very tough to say where the individual destruction factions go in. I kind of have to balance both what they can do in destruction soup with how they are on their own. Um, Slaves to Darkness is like this too. They have a lot of really powerful uh, synergies with certain allies, um, but their win rate is very, very low because they have so many traps. So it was kind of hard to put them in B tier when the best S2D fighters are in A tier, but it's kind of tough. Um, I think generally it's worth zooming in on this tier list. I'm going to wait a little bit longer so it can stay on screen a little bit more because I think this is what a lot of people tune in for. Um, but this is really where I would put the factions, you know, as what's possible for them um, outside of just win rates. So let's zoom in a little bit and let's start with the top two tiers. There's a couple interesting surprises here. I've already covered the top three and how, you know, they are extremely... <laughs> I said that Destruction Soup was annoying, so I should at least say that the top three are also very annoying. Their, their chaff just never dies. It's the worst. Um, but there are some interesting surprises outside of that, like Hunters of Huanchi. It's no longer just one or two players doing really well with Hunters of Huanchi. Lots of different players are doing well with a few different builds of Hunters of Huanchi. It's very powerful. Wilder Corps are coming in very, very powerful. It's time to admit that, like, Point and click is just a really, really powerful thing to be doing. Hunters of Huanchi are very good at ranged combat. Uh, Wilder Corps are very good at it. Castalites are okay at it. Um, and of course, KO are the kings of it. So it's just here to stay, I think. Um, gun lines, there were a lot of people complaining when 2.0 uh, changed over from 1.0 that uh, archers in general had just been nerfed into oblivion. But this is a melee game. Range d damage is inherently more powerful than melee damage. So the best ranged fighters are just going to be at the top of the meta. No matter what else is going on, no matter how much you nerf ranged shooting, the best ranged fighters are always going to be very good. Um, Skaven is a really interesting one here. They have consistently done very well for a while. They, in my opinion, have the best sort of Ogre Maw Tribes impression in Chaos. Uh, Spire Tyrants can do this too, where they just play a lot like Destruction Soup plays. Um, they have some interesting utility with Storm Vermin, and they have their Ogre leaders, quote-unquote, in Storm Fiends. Their leaders are a bit of a tax, but they are really fast, can score points, can you know, throw some interesting abilities around, stuff like that. So there's just a lot of play in Skaven. The same with um, Spire Tyrants who have those netters where they can net you and then bring in two big titans like a Ogre Myrmidon or a FOMO Crusher and just kind of do a Destruction Soup impression and be very, very powerful. And so that keeps them in A tier as well. And that kind of makes me want to talk about the shape of the meta outside of factions looking at A tier, because there really are these four overarching shapes that a list can kind of take that keep rising to the top over and over and over in a lot of tournament results that I look at. And the first is going to be smalls and talls. The next is destruction soup. Then I would say is point and click. And then a uh, Thing that I'm going to call Noble Bright Heroes, and uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. But first, Smalls and Talls is just where you flood the board with chaff, and then you just have a few titans. And sometimes you'll just have one giant elite thing, sometimes you'll have two. This is only a tier list based on how well factions execute this playstyle. As you'll see, 
The thing that makes horns broken is that they can do point and click and smalls and talls at the same time. That's true of KO as well. Um, a few different factions are powerful because they can kind of do both of these. But in general, if you're just committing to this idea, this is kind of how well each faction does it purely. Um, I think Slaves to Darkness could probably climb up that list a little bit. But in general, a lot of factions in the game can do this. A lot of the factions that can do this, that is the most powerful thing for them to be doing. Um, and it is just generally a really solid formula, no matter when you're doing it, how you execute it. The best factions in the game obviously execute this much better than the lower ones do. There's plenty of D-tier factions that can kind of do this. For example, I have Monster Killers as a D-tier smalls and talls faction. You can just spam Clutch of Grots and have you know, your one beast knob and then an ogre leader if you want to. I don't advise that. There's much more powerful things to do in Monster Killers, but you can do it. So I've kind of got the list here. Destruction Soup has a lot of factions that can kind of do it um, outside of Destruction. So like Sylvaneth can kind of do it with their netters. Um, Spire Tyrants, of course, do it pretty well. Uh, but of course, all the Destruction factions do it pretty well as well. Point and Click is this sort of... <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated than gun lines, but it, all the gun line factions can do it. Uh, KO and Horns are, of course, the best at it, uh, but there's a lot of A-tier factions that are pretty solid at it. Castellites can do it. Hunters of Huanchi can do it. Wilder Corps can do it. Monster Killers can actually do it with their crazy... Um, they're incredibly powerful ranged abilities, things like that. And then Cruel Boys can do it, although I wouldn't say they're as good at it as the other ones. They probably should have been down to B. Um, and then finally, Noble Bright Heroes. This is a playstyle where you essentially have a few threats, quite a few threats, that are not overwhelmingly powerful on any one threat, but are all big enough that they are not going to get one shot killed by a Titan. And then you kind of have this ability to cover the board where there is always a big threat near every single objective, and it gives you actually a pretty decent amount of chaff killing power too. So you will often just not completely roll over to some of the top factions, and you'll often like do a really good job just picking apart all of the different like janky things that things that people can be doing. So the reason why I have kind of this bottom box of everything else is because this sort of archetype, Noble Bright Heroes, does, I would say, lose to the other top shapes of lists. But it does kind of beat everything else. And then the other shapes also kind of beat everything else too. And you could kind of get frustrated that this is a very solidified situation happening. I'm kind of getting very abstract with you, but I just wanted to kind of communicate that, that there are these strategies that kind of cross different factions that work very, very well. And I love to see people try to innovate and get outside of that, but it is very difficult. And I think people haven't consistently had a ton of success doing other things that don't work this way. One thing that I am pretty excited about with some of the new factions that have just come out is, for example, Monster Killers and Flame Seekers have a very different playstyle, and they seem pretty good. And that playstyle is something that used to exist in the meta but stopped with the FAQ a year ago, and that is kind of broken triple as your playstyle. And the way I work, the way that works is... When 2.0 first dropped, there were a ton of really good triples like Dragon Maul, like the Resurrection, like the original version of Swift as the Wind, like uh, the original version of Lead from the Back. And these all got nerfed to oblivion in the first, um, the first FAQ to where the best triple left in the game was Fight for Profit. And so these factions... 
previously had all been kind of doing this thing where you have your broken kind of earth shattering triple and you just make the list choices you have to make to maximize the power of said triple. And you don't really worry too much about like the efficiency shape of your list because you know that your ability is going to be so powerful it's going to make up for all that. That playstyle has kind of gone by the wayside, but it's coming back in that Monstakillas have an incredibly powerful Harpoon triple. They have a very good triple from their other uh, neck slicer guy. Um, Flame Seekers have one of the best triples that's ever been in the game in terms of the Droth Master being able to give two move actions to a fighter. And so they have this ability to kind of build completely around just maximizing one ability. And so uh, it's possible we could see a new type of combo list start to enter the meta, but I think it's going to take quite a while, and I think it would need to take a few more factions with the same kind of idea behind them, um, which which might not happen, or it might happen. We don't know what you know, the new Lumineth or the new Night Haunt are going to do. Um, I would say based on, if they're going to be based on elf profiles and ghost profiles, which are two of the worst base profiles in the game, they're going to need to have pretty powerful abilities to make those good. And so uh, I really do think there's going to be kind of a new hot play style in terms of ability combo lists that kind of enter the meta, but we're only just seeing the very first hints of it right now. We're not really seeing an established archetype um, that is something that you have to respond to, right? So for example, I would never build a list without thinking about how weak am I to just an ogre titan running around? How weak am I to a giant swarm of chaff? Um, things like that. How weak am I to like shooting coming out of Wilder Corpse or uh, KO? I might not consider Noble Bright Heroes if I'm making a list, but I would definitely consider the other three uh, sort of list shapes that are out there when I'm building a list for a tournament I want to win. Uh, I would not yet build, like, how do I disrupt this ability combo that's going to happen? And so if that does enter the meta, that could be really cool, and it could add a whole new layer. Um, and that would be really exciting. I do think... You know, the games are really interesting right now. When you play Destruction Soup versus a Chaff Swarm Warband, it's a really interesting game. Um, I've kind of ranked Smalls and Talls leaning on Destruction Soup a little bit here because historically, so far, these Chaff Swarm plus an Elite helping out, those Warbands have won a little bit more than they've lost against Destruction Soup. Um, I think other than KO, I think most of the, well, and Horns really, but Horns is kind of a, a hybrid between a couple of these. Um, generally, the point-and-click warbands haven't necessarily asserted themselves quite as much as Chaff Swarm or Destruction Soup have, but they've been very good. They have won occasional tournaments. Very excited to see if sort of bringing ability combo lists into the meta. If they can win games against some of these lists that aren't necessarily expecting them, that would be really exciting. It could bring some of the anti-support hero factions kind of back or some of the fighters back, like Enlightened Aviarchs on disc might have new life again that they didn't have before. That could be very interesting. It's also possible that some of the shooting gunline warbands might just blow the ability combo warbands off the table. So we'll see, but I'm very excited to see how that goes, and um, there's a lot to like there. As far as everything else goes, there are a ton of other ways to build a list. There are a ton of other playstyles out there. I would say the games at the very top of the meta are extremely interesting. The games at the bottom are extremely interesting. They're just kind of different games right now. And there is sort of, um, I would say, my Noble Bright Heroes thing does kind of bridge that. Uh, for example, I um, played Sylvaneth with a lot of Kurnoth Hunters recently at a tournament. I went 3-1. and one. I did pretty well. When I lost my game to Horns of Hashut, 
it did feel like I was getting picked apart, like I was a set of traffic cones a little bit. Um, maybe on some other types of missions, it would have been a closer game, but it did feel like when I came up against the top meta list, it was very, very difficult. But my games otherwise were very interesting, and I played against a lot of different variety, and it was a ton of fun. And so I do think that that archetype kind of bridges halfway in between the top of the meta and everything else um, in a really interesting way. So the games are really good. Don't let this diagram kind of turn you off just because of what it looks like. Let's take a look at B tier, which is kind of a microcosm of that divide. Because Stormcast, I kind of consider the gatekeepers of B tier. They are kind of the most dedicated to that noble bright heroes archetype that I talked about. Um, Beasts of Chaos are, I would say, the only faction better than Stormcast that I still put in B tier. Um, maybe it's because they have a lot of traps, like Bestigors. Maybe it's because, you know, their, their elite stuff like Doom Bulls are really good, but maybe not quite as good as some of the Destruction Titans and um, really just like on par with the top Chaos Titans. So it's like what really brings you to BOC over just other things that Chaos can ally in. It's tough, but they are very good, and they win a lot. So there is an argument that they should be in A, but I kept them in B. Otherwise, B tier is really cool because it's a lot of sweet jank that actually works, that actually does the thing. Um, Flame Seekers do the combo that they say they're going to do on the box, which is really awesome, and it works. Um, you know, Lumineth you can build these little fragile castles that become not fragile anymore once they've been built. Um, they were, I had them kind of in A tier in my last video, and then a bunch of people tried them and didn't do very well and brought their win rate back around 50%. Um, and that's really awesome. I think there's a lot that can go wrong with Lumineth, which is why it they shouldn't be in B, but they absolutely have A tier potential. And there's a lot of factions here like that. Um, I think like Darkling Covens have been kind of up and down in terms of how they've been doing and so have uh, Seas of Sigmar Dispossessed. But they really, both of those factions have a potential. Um, same is true with Jade Obelisk, really. But there's just a lot of kind of things that can go wrong which keep them in B tier, that keep them out of the top of the metagame. And that's great. That's a great place to be. The same is true with C-tier. C-tier factions against each other are awesome. The games are incredible. Um, I really think that C-tier is like the most fun tier. I might try to do like a video series on celebrating C-tier because uh, I think there's a lot of really fun stuff going on. Like Dark Oath Savagers are a great example of a really deeply flawed warband that's not very good, but that like legitimately does a thing when you play with them. And so they're really fun to play, and they're really fun to play against other factions that are kind of doing a similar thing. You just have to know that, you know, you're not going to beat really tuned warbands with the thing they do, but you're still going to feel like you're playing Warcry against them. You're still going to feel like you are kind of testing them, making them really show what they've got. And I think that's a wonderful place to be. Um, all of these factions have like a real plan. Uh, Corn Bloodbound and Zinch Arcanites, for example, when you just look at win rates, they are some of the worst win rates in the game. But you can build those factions to be pretty reasonable. I had Zinch Arcanites at the very bottom here because the only reasonable thing is like some of the Zangors are pretty good. <laughs> so that's a little bit more of a struggle, but in general, Everything in C tier is very, very layered, very interesting. Like, really fascinating games can be had just between C and B warbands, which is different than where we have to end the video a little bit. We are talking tier lists. We're going to go down, which means we're going to end in D. And there are a lot of factions here, and maybe more than in previous videos. And I think... Uh, the poet Yeats said it best, Yeats, I think, uh, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction. 
while the worst are full of passionate intensity. I take this in Warcry to mean essentially that the battles in the Gnarlwood have been raging for a year with our current paradigm, 18 months with our current edition, and the players are just learning. The players are getting better at every event that you go to, at every local game store you get go to. The people are just more competent than they were a year ago. And so it's a lot harder to just kind of, if you are showing up and it's just, hey, these are some models I own. If you're playing one of the higher tier factions, there's a chance that some of those models are going to be good enough that you're going to survive a little bit playing kind of a, a warband that you didn't put, you know, a ton of thought into. It was just like, this, this is what I have painted, right? Um, if you are playing one of these factions, you just can't really hide anymore. If, if it's untuned, you're just going to not even be playing Warcry. If it is tuned, you're just not... Again, it's like if you're playing against someone who really knows what they're doing and the tough thing now is that casual players know what they're doing now in Warcry. We see casual players all the time who um, just <laughs> have played. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Like you can, a year ago you could be a casual player and you really hadn't played much Warcry in this edition. You were just trying out your first couple war bands. Now you can go to your local game store and play Warcry against someone who identifies as a casual player, doesn't play a lot, maybe only gets, you know, a couple games in a month, but that has added up at this point to where they've tried a couple things that didn't work, and now they're trying something else that's working a lot better, and their warband has, like, an actual plan on the battlefield, and they're doing real things, and it's it's harder to get wins now, just in general. Um, I think the, the difference between a sort of casual mid-tables player and someone who is walking in just kind of doing their best with a low tier faction is going to be a lot higher now than it was and so it's it's a lot harder to hide with these really really weak factions which is too bad um we are in a place where i would love to see us get a points update i think that could help a lot of these quite a bit but i don't want to completely turn you off i think in general there's a lot of really sweet stuff going out there. Like I said before, the games at the top tier are incredible and compelling and really interesting. They feel really balanced among the best stuff. The games between B and C tier factions are incredible and varied and you see so much variety and they all feel really balanced. And honestly, if you do just play D-tier factions against other D-tier factions, I actually watched a uh, Daughters of Cain versus Nighthaunt game recently, and it was a thriller. It was really sweet. So the D-tier, when it plays against each other, is really, really fun right now. So I think just in general, if you go to an event, you need to just be aware of that. And if you're just playing casually at your local game store, it is worth maybe kind of having the conversation now about like what kind of game are you expecting what would you like to play you know maybe having a couple different warbands that can play at different types of games um can really behoove you if you are showing up if you're one of the more experienced players in your local meta game and you're showing up to your lgs having a few different options that you can play at different power levels would behoove you and might kind of make everyone at your lgs have a really good time because the games are amazing when similar power warbands are fighting, and hopefully we get a points update soon to kind of compress the top and the bottom. But until then, I do think Warcry is really fun right now, and I will be back with more casual videos in the future. But needed to get this out there because we've had so many different tournament developments. And so until those more casual videos, may all your roles be crits.